He is the revealer of your word. He brings illumination to your word and to our hearts that we would see everything that we need to see. And Father, we just love being about your business and accomplishing what you want accomplished, advancing the kingdom of God. So I believe this morning that receiving this word will steady us and hold us firm so that we'll be able to rise to your purpose on purpose and do all that you want for us to do so that we can be like the Apostle Paul. And when we come to the end of our journey here on this earth, we'll be able to say we've run the race and we've finished our course. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. But over in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, all of many of us are familiar with this. But it says, So Jesus answered and said unto them, meaning saying unto the twelve, the disciples, Have faith in God. Now some translations say, Have the faith of God. But I want to really focus on what the New King James says here. Have faith in God. Because to stand firm and to hold fast, you've got to have faith in God. Now, I know we preach a lot on the promises of God. We preach a lot on the inheritances of God and preach a lot on, the, on the, what's been provided for us. But ultimately, none of that can come true or will manifest in our life unless we have faith in God. Or let me say it this way. We need to have faith in the promiser and not in the promises. And I think sometimes that's, that's where we, we cripple ourselves is that we get so excited about the promises and we should, not saying we shouldn't, we need to know what's ours. Come on, if you don't know what's yours, you can't even grab onto it. You can't even trust God for it. But sometimes we get so excited about the promises that we start putting our faith in the promises. But Jesus says here, have faith in God. We're to have faith in God. We're not to have faith in the promises. Come on, we're not to have faith or trust in people. How many know we're not to have faith or trust in people? It doesn't say have faith in people. Yeah. I learned a long time ago, don't put faith in people. Even people that care about you, love you, you know that you know they're, they're, they're no, they have no intention ever to hurt you in any way, shape, or form. Even those people can let you down. It's not their intention. They don't have any plan or desire to. Their goal is not to do that in your life. But circumstances in life can cause people to make decisions, and it can hurt you. So it doesn't, notice it does not say have faith in people. It says have faith in God. Everyone say have faith in God. Faith in God really makes it simple when you say to yourself, I'm going to have faith in God. Even when you're trusting and believing for something to manifest in your life, healing, prosperity, relationships restored, family situations restored, whatever it is, it makes it a whole lot easier when you say, I have faith in you, Lord. Because the moment you add anything to that, you start to get involved with your way and your will and how you think it will manifest and how you think it'll happen. And you get in there and you want to start helping God. How many have ever got in there wanting to help God? I God, I, I, can, I can give you a hand here. I know exactly the best thing to do here. <laughs> like God doesn't know thing is, is God knew about your situation before it even happened. Yeah. If we think about that and keep that in the forefront of our mind, it's a whole lot easier to say, you know what, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you, God, because you knew about it before I ever knew about it. You knew it was going to happen. And according to the scripture, that when we're put in, when situations arise in our life, God's fully aware of it according to 1 Corinthians 10, and it says that he's made a way of escape. So he, he, he knows about it before it happens. He's already created an escape route 
before it happens. But you've got to trust him. I said, you've got to trust him. So we're just going to jump off from just that one scripture. I'm not going to go in to verse 23, 24, about speaking under the mountain. That's a whole message in and of itself. Many times we, we miss it there too is, is we're speaking to the, to the symptoms and we're not speaking to the mountain. You got to speak to the mountain. The symptoms are a result of the mountain. Kind of shared that the last couple of weeks with regards to Jesus being on the boat. Jesus rebuked the wind. He just told the waves, enough, hush. Because the waves were a result of the wind. He had to deal with the wind. Once he dealt with the wind, the wave stopped. So we've got to know what the mountain is. In many situations in our life, it'd be good before we start praying and start quoting all of our scriptures and everything is just to quiet ourselves and say, Lord, what is the mountain here? If we already know what the mountain is, then speak to it. I love the testimony that Mark Hankins gives about when his wife Trina had a tumor, inoperable tumor. Doctor said there was nothing they could do. And uh, they came, she was in the hospital. This was, I don't know how many years ago, 20 plus years ago. And she's fine today. But I remember uh, his testimony is, is the doctor come in and said, you know, she's got an inoperable tumor. There's nothing we can do to get it out. And uh, it will probably paralyze her and she'll be bedridden for the rest of her life. And he says, when the doctor walked out, because he'd been taught this by, by Dad Hagen, by Kenneth E. Hagen, he said, I didn't talk to God about the tumor. He said, I sat down, he says, next to the bed, next to Trina's bed and said, tumor, we're going to have a talk. Because that was the mountain. He didn't talk to God about the mountain. Come on. Many times that's what we do. We talk to God about the problem. It doesn't tell us to talk to God about the problem. It says talk to the problem. You talk to the mountain. He's given us authority for us to talk to the mountain. But many times that's what we do is we go to God and it's like, God, you know, there's a mountain in my way and you just don't understand. And, uh, we go on and on and on. He didn't tell us to talk to him. He said, you, Jesus said, you. I said I wasn't going to teach on this, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus said, you talk to the mountain. So that's what we need to start doing, amen? If you haven't been doing it, that's what we need to start doing. Talk to the mountain yourself. The mountain needs to hear your voice. Needs to hear your voice. Amen. Amen. I'm going to stop there. I said I wasn't going down that path. We are talking about holding fast, about our voice. The Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. He who promised. He who promised. Remember, it says, have faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Well, Hebrews 10, 23 says, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Another translation says, hold fast to the profession of your faith. Now, you can use the word profession in, uh, in line with confession, but... Profession is also, uh, can be used, what is your profession? What is your profession? And I'm not talking about talking. What is your profession? Roger's profession, he was a, a mailman. God blessed him greatly through 30 years of working as a government servant. Blessed him greatly. They could share all kinds of, he could share all kinds of details Donna could share all kinds of details of how God supernaturally took care of things when they were facing medical things with their son and how without that profession, without that blessing of medical insurance, they might not have made it. A good paying wage, things being, I mean, lots of things happened. Yeah. Millions of things. 
And you could go, well, he was just a lowly mailman. No, who, who cares about the profession? It was how God worked through the profession. See, how God works through your profession. It can be your profession as far as what you do. It can be through your profession of what you speak. But how God works through your profession. And to be good at your profession, you've got to know all the ins and outs. Come on. I'm taking a little different slant here on profession. Professionals in any arena of life, the reason why they become professionals and advance beyond amateurs is because they put forth some effort and learn things, something about it. Well, we need to be professionals in faith. We need to be professionals in our confession. We need to be. Yes. We can't speak it because Kenneth Hagin spoke it and expect to be a professional. We can learn because anybody who learns their profession, they learn it from others, but they have to put it to work for themselves so that it begins to work for them. You can't just go around and say, well, you know, Smith Wigglesworth said, and, and uh, Lester Summerall said, and Kenneth Copeland said, and Kenneth Hagen said. No, even professionals have coaches. The men and women of, of, that have gone by that before us, that have given us their books and their revelation, have shared their revelation with them, is because they're sharing with us, just like a coach shares with a professional, teaching them some things. But if you don't ever get out there, I mean, yeah, I, I, when I was thinking about this, uh, one this person that sticks out of my mind is Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is relentless. I mean, I just read an article now after his accident that he had back in February of last year. They said he's now reached the point, and both of his legs were, were shattered, and, or his ankle was shattered, and he broke both of his, both of his uh, femurs in the, in the car accident that he was in, the rollover. And he has now reached a point, I just read the article a couple days ago, he's ready to start going out on the course and starting to hit balls. That's driven. That's whole fast. His desire for the game that he loves so much. Come on, our desire to fulfill God's purpose, our desire, we need to become professionals. Amen. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, Lord. <laughs> You're not going to become a professional with two hours on Sunday morning. No. It's not going to happen. Tiger Woods is out on that. They said, I don't know if he's still probably in his condition. Now he's working into it. But I know back in his prime, they said he was on the course or he was out practicing, whether it was putting, swinging with his coaches and everything, eight hours a day. Eight hours a day. We want to heal the sick on two hours a week. Look at just let, let's take it. Let, let's not even look at that. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus was in the temple at twelve years old. Think of yourself as a twelve-year-old kid. Did you want to sit in church? Would you want to sit in church? Would you be sitting in the temple? Jesus was learning. He was preparing himself for his profession, which was the Messiah, to deliver humanity. He was preparing himself to go to the cross. He was preparing himself to hold fast. To hold fast to what he was sent for. Because how many know there were lots of opportunities, just as there is for us. There's lots of opportunities that can come along to get you to lose your grip or let go or release your hold. <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't want to release my hold. Now, thank God if I release my hold, <laughs> he's always holding on. I said, God is always holding on. He never lets go of us. Aren't you glad that he doesn't let go of you? <laughs> but it will serve us well that is the way he's holding on to us that we hold on to him. <laughs> Hold fast to your profession. 
Hold fast to your confession of faith. What is your confession of faith? Ultimately, he's Lord. Breaking it right down to the nitty-gritty. He's it. I mean, if the Bible, if Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God, and the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 10, 23, that we're to hold fast to our profession of faith or of trust, it's hold fast that it's God. Amen. It's nothing about me. It's nothing I can do. He's already done it. The Bible even tells us that with Abraham, that he could swear by no one greater. So God swore by himself. When he cut covenant with Abraham, he could swear by no one greater. So he swore by himself. Why? Because God knew that if, if he made a, a covenant with Abraham and Abraham was to swear and God was to swear, he knew that there were, could be some faltering there. Well, he did the same thing with us. Jesus came into the earth, the Son of God, and that's who he cut the covenant with, really. When you accept what Christ did, you become part of that it is now your covenant, but he really cut covenant with his son because he needed to swear by someone that held the same position that he held. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> because God knew this, like if I cut covenant with them, it's not going to work. <laughs> so he said, I'm going to cut covenant with myself. I'm going to send my son into the earth and I will cut covenant with myself for them, on behalf of them. So that the cutting of the covenant that I make with myself will now become their covenant. It's always all about God. It's always all about God. It's never about us. Now, does that mean that absolves us from beginning to walk out? No, to hold fast, you begin to walk out what God has done in you. You receive by faith what Christ did as yours, and you begin to walk that out. That's part of holding fast. That's part of holding fast. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians, I'll give you a couple more scriptures on holding fast. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Test all things. In other words, you could say, look at what is going on maybe in your life or what is being presented to you, and if it's good, meaning it's from God, because the Bible tells us that every good thing comes from above, if it's good, grab onto it, man. It's funny, this morning, as I was looking over notes and looking over things, and uh, our littlest dog that we've got, Ashley, she's about a four-pound poodle slash Maltese, and she's just this tiny little fluff ball. But for some reason, this morning at about 6.30, she had a wild hair. <laughs> and she jumped up on the couch with one of her toys, and she just looking at me and shaking it back and forth. Well, I know what that means. It's like, let's play. <laughs> so I grabbed a hold of it, and she held fast. As I'm pulling, she's not letting go. The harder I pull, the harder that little four-and-a-half-pound dog is like... <laughs> Now, yes, I could have gotten away from her, obviously, but you understand my point is she, she, in her mind, it's mine. I'm not letting go, and there's nothing you can do to take it away from me. <laughs> That's the way we've got to be. Remember the last couple of weeks talking about the enemy? He's coming for the word. The word is ours. It's mine, and there's nothing you can do to take it away from me. Well, many times, you know, we we've, we've roll over. It's just like, it's just too hard. That's not holding fast. As a believer, to hold fast to the profession of your faith, you never lay down and play dead. You never roll over. You never allow what comes out of your mouth to say, I can't do this anymore. You may have the thought. How many have ever had the thought, I don't think I can do this anymore? Just don't give words to it. A thought is just a thought. A thought is just a thought. I love Roger shares a testimony that his father shared with him. A thought unspoken, unacted on, unacted on will, die. will die. Good or bad. And I like that, good or bad. Because, see, to hold fast to your profession, there is some things we should be speaking. 
There is some things we should be doing, and that is acting on the Word of God. But just because you have a thought, the enemy will come along and beat you. You ever notice how the enemy will come along? He brings the thought, and then he'll beat you up for having the thought. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> And we'll buy into it and go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I had that thought. It's just a thought. <laughs> it is just a thought. You know, you're driving down the road, and it's just like, I just want to run that person into the guardrail. It's just a thought. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> No, those are, that, that's a big one. And we know the big ones you don't act on. You know, I just want to kill that person. It's like, no, it's just a thought. But the little ones in life. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean you have to act on it. Just because a thought comes, it's just a thought. It's when you begin to act on it, when you begin to give it life. You give it life by beginning to, many times it starts first by talking about it. Well, I wonder, what if? Entertainment, entertaining the thought. Don't even entertain it. You say, well, what happens if it comes back? It's still just a thought. But when you begin to role play in your head, there's still an area, and I don't know, I get sucked into it so many times till this day. I, I don't mind telling off on myself because you know what? I'm, I'm walking this faith thing out just like you're walking it out. And, and just because God's called me to pastor doesn't mean that what he's called me to do here helps me in everyday life. I've got to walk out the walk of faith just like y'all have to walk out. But... When somebody or something goes on, and it, it, either whether you've been done wrong or, or you start thinking thoughts about, you know, well, when I, when I get an opportunity to talk to so-and-so, I'm going to say this. And then all of a sudden, after you do that, you go, and I know that when they say this back to me, then I'm going to say this. And then when they respond to that, then I'm going to say this. And, you know, five minutes, ten minutes goes by, and you've had a conversation with somebody that's not even there. <laughs> And you've been entertaining everything that you say you're going to say and everything that they're going to say. And, and you don't even know if they're going to say it. Sometimes it's because maybe you've had a past experience with them, so you're just automatically assuming that that's the way they're going to respond because you think you know. How many know it's better to not go down that path? I've gotten a lot better at it. Instead of going five or ten minutes, the Lord cuts me off after about a minute. He's like, what are you doing? It's like, you're right. You're right. Just going to let it go. And in all honesty, you know, it's, it's kind of like Facebook. It's real easy to have an opinion when you're not face-to-face. -face. So when you're having this dialogue in your head about with somebody, it's real easy to have an opinion. Well, if they say this, then I'll, I'll go, G -g 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 -g. and then they'll come back and say this, and I'll, G -g 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 -g. when the reality of it is, if you're standing face-to-face -face with the person, you won't say a peep. You just sit there like... Come on, hold fast to your profession. Hold fast to the things that you know, but ultimately hold fast to Christ as Lord. That's really what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. Hold fast to your initial profession. He's Lord. He knows better. Trust in Him. Don't trust in everything you think you know. Trust in Him. Don't trust in the scriptures that you've memorized. Trust in Him. That's why Jesus was able to make the statement, you know, I only say what I hear the Father say, and I only do what I see the Father do. Jesus didn't trust in everything that he learned while he was in the temple. He trusted the Holy Ghost on the inside of him to speak to him at that moment. How many know Jesus probably knew a lot of the Word? The Bible says he was the Word. He probably knew some of it. The Bible says that Jesus always was. He was with the Father in the beginning. The beginning of what? I don't know. 
long before we were here. He knew the Father quite well, but he was always listening and getting his direction from the Father. Have faith in God. Jesus even told the disciples when they said, Lord, how should we pray? And they, they, he said, that we know the scriptures. It says, our Father who art in heaven. We're to pray to God. We don't pray to Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray in the authority of Jesus' name. But we pray to God. I've heard people pray to Jesus. Don't pray to Jesus. Jesus didn't even tell us, don't pray to me. <laughs> pray to the Father. Once you get born again, you pray to the Father. You go to the Father just like he went to the Father. You just go in the authority. You go to the Father in the authority of Jesus' name. You're, identify, you're identifying with Christ, and you go to the Father in that identity. Basically, you go boldly before him and just say, the same way Jesus came to you, I'm coming to you. The same way you responded to your son Jesus, now you're going to respond to me, your son, or me, your daughter, because you're coming in that name. You're coming in that authority. You're coming in that identity. You're coming in who you are. See, these things, these types of things, that's how we can hold fast. We can hold fast because we know who we are in Christ. And we don't, we don't, I'm thinking about our, my little dog. That little dog doesn't know it's a little dog. <laughs> it doesn't. See, we've got to become that way in our, in our profession of faith and who we are in Christ. We don't know we're anything but little Christ's. If we think we're anything less, we won't hold fast because something will come along that will jar us enough to go, yeah, this one's too big for me. But Ashley, that little dog of ours, she has no idea she's four and a half pounds. All she knows is, is when she's got a hold of that toy and she wants to play, it's mine. That's what we've got to be like. I've seen, I've watched YouTube videos of pit bulls that will grab a hold of a tire and they'll swing and that dog will be straight out, feet not touching the ground as they swing it and they'll never let go. Yeah. <laughs> Just round and around and they'll swing as long as that thing is swinging. They won't let go. Why? Because it's theirs. See, to hold fast to something, you hang on to it till it's yours. You hold on to it till, because you know it's yours. I'm not letting go of it. There's nothing you can do to get me to let go of it. It's mine. How do you know it's yours? Because I have faith in God. Not because you have faith in the promise. Not because you have faith in something that you've done. Not because you have faith in the word that you know. Not because you have faith in anything other than because I have faith in God. God said it's mine. It's mine. And I'm not letting go of that. All kinds of things in your life will come along to try to get you to let go. Telling you, well, you haven't prayed long enough. Well, you're not walking in love. Well, you haven't tithed. Well, you're not giving. Well, you don't go to church faithfully. What are, those are all important things. Those position us and keep us in, help us stay holding fast. Because all of the things that the Word talks about that we should do as a believer... Every one of them that we say we don't need to do or we refuse to do, because let's be honest, there's some things we just flat out refuse. Well, I know what your word says, but as if you're the creator of the heavens and the earth and you made me, but I know me a little better than you do. How many know the manufacturer knows the product that's been manufactured better than the product? He's like, I made you. I know what you need. Oh, no, 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 you don't, Lord. You don't understand. I've lived life. I've been on this earth for 45, 50, 55, 60, 65 years. Gone through a lot of things. I know exactly what to do. Yeah, but you don't know what's ahead. doesn't make any difference. I know what to do because I've gone through it before, and I know exactly how to get things done. And just right. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
With that attitude, you'll start to let go of some things because things will come along. And say, Why do we hold fast to him? See, that's what we're saying, hold fast to your profession. You're holding fast to who he is, to holding fast to his faithfulness. That's what you're holding fast to. You're holding fast to his faithfulness. Why is that so important? Because he knows things that are out in front of you that you don't know. He tells you and directs you to do certain things. He tells us in the Bible, and then he also speaks to, to us personally things because he sees things you don't see. He knows things you don't know. So you hang on to him as your faithfulness, his faithfulness. You're hanging on to him. You're holding fast to that profession because when he speaks something to you, you've got nothing to do but to turn and keep listening to him. But the moment you begin to let go of him and his faithfulness and start to think about something that you could do or something that you've done or something that you haven't done, now all of a sudden it's not on him, it's about you. And you'll not see the things that are right in front of you. You'll not even see the things that are coming. You're just kind of like, well, I just know what to do. I'm thinking, I can't think of anything specific, but I'm thinking there has been times in my life where I've just been so dogmatic in like I just know what to do that I've missed things along the way. And all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of like, well, I think of it this way. You're driving, and you just know, I just know where I'm going. And then all of a sudden you realize, did I miss a turn? You ever done that before? And then have to back up, turn around, go back. Because we get so confident in our ability in something that we know. It's just like, no, you have to stay tuned in. And that is staying tuned in to the Holy Ghost. You always have to stay tuned in to the Holy Spirit. That's part of holding fast to the profession of your faith. Now, I wanted to just share some scripture with you here, and then we'll receive our communion. There are a couple other scriptures that I was going to share with you about holding fast. Hebrews chapter 3, you can just write these down and look at them yourself. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 5 through 6, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14 talks about holding fast, steadfastness. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We've got somebody that's already made it, that's done it. And that person, that's an example because he's, Jesus held fast to the Father. He didn't come on the earth to do his own thing. He never was here on the earth doing his own thing. He is our, how many know he's our perfect example of someone that held fast? He, Jesus would not have been able to finish his course on this earth, go to the cross, and accomplish all the things he accomplished if he would not have held fast to the faith in his Father. See, all the things that the Bible tells us about holding fast and everything is because that's what Jesus did. That's what Hebrews 4 and 14 says. See then that we have a great high priest who has passed through. Jesus, the Son of God, telling us, Jesus did it this way. That's the way I would interpret. Jesus did it this way. You need to do it this way. But many times we look at Jesus' life, and it's just like, I don't know if I want to do it that way. Well, he's not going to ask us to do some of the things that he asked Jesus to do, but we're going to get through the things of life the same way Jesus got through them, which is holding fast to the faithfulness of the Father. God was Jesus' Father. He's our Father. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad? Yes. I said, aren't you glad? Job chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, it says, Then, <laughs> I love this, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? You'll have people that are, you're going you're gonna to continue to stand and trust God. You're going to hold fast to this God that you said will deliver you. You're going to hold fast to this God that says you're healed. You're going to hold fast to this God that says, and her response says, curse God and die. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> That's his wife. <laughs> help me. How? how yeah, his helpmate. <laughs> Dear Lord. <laughs> Never thought about that. Yeah, here's your helpmate telling you, hey, curse God and die. 
How many know that when you've got someone that close to you in your life, they may not come right out and say those exact words, but when they're telling you to turn your back on the Father, your Father, that's basically what they're saying. Well, just curse God and die. Just give it up. All it is is a challenge for you to let go of your hold on God. We don't ever let go of our hold on God. No matter who says something to us, no matter what they say to us. Come on. Because there will be people in our life just like Job. <laughs> it could be a parent. It can be a spouse. It can be a child. It, it can be anybody. But people, this is a picture of someone pretty close. The one that you married and said you loved is telling you curse God and die. That's when you know, am I going to hold fast? It goes on verse 10. But he said to her, you speak as one of a foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all those Job did not sin with his lips. He did not sin with his lips, which means he's, I'm sticking with God. I'm not going to talk the problem. I'm not going to talk the issue. I'm not going to allow anything other than my faithfulness in the Father to come out. God is faithful, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, well, what about this? God is faithful. That's all there is to it. Well, I've not seen God do this. How do you explain that? God is faithful, and I'm sticking with him. Sometimes the simplest answers in response to people that are challenging you or circumstances that are challenging you, the simplest that God is faithful, and that's all I know. God is faithful. That's all I know. God is faithful. That's all I know. How do you know God is faithful? Because the Bible says God is faithful. That's all I know. Come on. If, you can't, if you've got your Bibles with you, turn over to 2 Kings. We're going to just look at one person here that's not always talked about a lot when it comes to holding fast because we like to tell stories about David and Samson and Abraham and Moses and, you know, Elijah, and, and that's all great, and those are the stories we hear a lot, but this is kind of an obscure one here, but it really brings across a point because in 2 Kings chapter 18, it's talking about King Hezekiah, king of Judah. And for the sake of time, because it's already 1130, we're going to receive our communion here. But in chapter 5, it says here, talking about King Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. So it's saying here, he trusted in God. And he trusted, it's, it's kind of setting the stage here, he trusted in God to a point where God saw fit to say in his word to have written down and documented for us that there was not another king before him or after him. How many know it would be good to look at King Hezekiah's life? Because for God to make that statement, there is no other king like him before him or after him. That's how much he trusted me. It says, verse 6, For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. He did not depart from following him. How many know that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to follow him? He's our shepherd, and he's leading. That means we don't ever get out in front. <laughs> we're to follow him. Follow means you're behind keeping your eye on him. That's really hold fast is one of the definitions of that, is to keep your eyes fixed on him. You can't hold fast unless you got your eyes fixed on him. If we get a, ahead of him or we take a turn away from him or whatever, it's hard to hold fast. You'll begin to let go because you can't see what he's doing and what he's saying and hear what he's saying. But it says here, for he held fast, talking about him, King Hezekiah, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, or you could say, but kept the word which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. Say, the Lord is with me. See, the Lord is with you, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Whether you do acknowledge it, he's with you in every situation. That's why he can lead you out. That's why the Bible says that he provides a way of escape, because he's with you in the midst of it. And he's saying, follow me out. I will lead you out of this. I am your way of escape. I am your way of escape, which means I know the path to take to get out of this unharmed, unscathed. 
When you get through this thing, you're going to come out on the other side. You're going to be just like the three Hebrew children. You don't even smell like smoke. I love that story. That's another one of faithfulness, steadfastness, is the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're thrown into the fiery furnace for not obeying the king. They were snitched on, and the king says, man, I hate to do this, but i got to throw you in because you just made it. And their, their stance was, you know what? We don't care what you do because our God will deliver us. And I love the story because it always brings me to just a natural understanding of things is they were thrown into a fire and it says that they came out not even smelling of smoke. And I've used this example so many times. How many have ever sat around a bonfire? How many have ever tried to sit around a bonfire and pos continue to position yourself around a fire so you don't go home smelling like smoke? But yet when you get home, you smell like smoke. You can't sit around a bonfire and not smell like smoke. It's not going to happen. Smoke will find its way into your clothes, and even when you think, it's like, yeah, I've accomplished it as you're sitting around a fire. That's just because you're sitting around a fire and you're smelling smoke. It's not until you get into the fresh air where you're going, dang. I've actually told myself when we've been sitting around a fire before and I've been positioning myself, it's like because I don't, when, I, when we leave, I know it's going to be late in the evening when we leave. I don't want to go home and have to jump in the shower. And you leave and you get home and you go, yeah, I got no choice. <laughs> because you smell like smoke. God delivered them out of the furnace. It says that when they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. Sounds to me like total restoration. Sounds to me like completeness. Amen? When you can come away from a fire and not even smell like smoke. I don't know how God did that, but you know what? He did it. He did it. But verse 7 here, back to chapter 18, verse 7 of, of uh, 2 Kings. It says, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He prospered wherever he went. When you hold fast to the things of God, you'll prosper wherever you go. There's benefits to holding fast. When you hold fast to the word of God, you'll prosper. And I know in situations in all of our lives, man, when, when, you're, when you're hanging on with everything you've got, uh, you begin to release your grip or begin to lose your grip because you're thinking nothing good can come out of this. I just can't hang on anymore. But you know what? Reach down deep on the inside of yourself and just say, you know what? I'm hanging on. I'm going to be just like the three Hebrew children even. It's just like, you know what? You can throw me into the fire. It doesn't make any difference. But I am not bowing down to anything that the enemy has to say or anything that's coming at me in my life. I'll go to my grave before I will not trust God. And you know what? With that type of attitude, even if you were to go to your grave, even if the three Hebrew children would have died in the fire, they would not have died because of their faith in God. See, death doesn't have a sting like we think it does. We think we're losing out. We're thinking, oh my gosh, I, you know what? I, I just can't trust God any longer because I might give something up here on this earth. And it's like, what are you giving up? What are you giving up? In reality, what are you giving up? Nothing. Why oh, might, and you fill in the blank, I might lose, fill in the blank. Really lose? Can you lose going, to God, going on to be with the Father? Can you lose? That's a reality. That's why you can hold fast. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, hold fast to your profession. That's why in the book of Hebrews, it talks, it, it, it starts there in chapter 10, leads you into chapter 11. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. It talks about, gives us examples of those that by faith, because they knew that by faith, there was one greater. By faith. There was going to be a Messiah by faith that they knew they'd be okay. By faith, they could accomplish even though they didn't know. By faith, 
They held fast to the promise of God. They held fast to God himself because if God said it, that settles it by faith. And then it goes on to chapter 12 in Hebrews. Lay aside every weight and everything that would beset you, so easily beset you. There's a reason why the, 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 the Hebrews chapter 11, all the stories of faith is sandwiched in between hold fast to your profession, chapter 10, cast aside every weight and sin that so easily besets you. Because if you're not holding fast to who the Father is and you're not casting aside your old life, you're never going to walk by faith. <laughs> There's some things, there, there is a person you've got to grab onto and there are some things that you've got to let go of. That whole thing, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, is you've got to read it in its context. We love to read all the by faiths and we should. They stir us up. But the reason why he gives us all the by faiths in chapter 11, because he, he starts it by saying, you got to hold fast. Do you know that those that are written of in chapter 11 held fast? He's showing us an example. These are the ones that held fast. These are the ones that would not let go. These are the ones that followed me, regardless of what they were facing. These are the ones. And then he talks about all of them in chapter 11, and then in verse 12, he said, and the reason why they walk by faith is because they let go of what they thought they knew. They let go of this life. They let go of everything in this life. This life meant nothing to them. They cast it aside. They set it aside. That's all about what it talks about, hold fast your profession. Hold fast to what profession? Jesus is Lord. How would you get saved? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord, meaning master, supreme in authority. I'm not saying it's an easy thing because sometimes it's not to say, you're master, you are supreme in authority. What you say holds all the way. I, I get the, the kicking back and saying, wait a minute here. <laughs> Lord, you don't understand. I always love, because I've done it before. It's like, Lord, you don't understand. It's like, really? He doesn't understand. <laughs> no, people around you may not understand what you're doing, but how many know he knows and understands what's going on? <laughs> There's nothing that he does not understand about your circumstance or what you're going through. Nothing. He understands. So if you like to, I'm just going to say that, I'll just say this. If you like to use that phrase with him when you get in a tight spot, stop using it because he does understand. It would be really better to humble yourself and say, Lord, I know you understand exactly what I'm going through. That's why you have a way of escape, because you do understand what I'm going through, and you've provided a way, and that way is, is to follow you. Come on. I'm preaching better than you're responding. But it says here, it says, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. He rebelled against the king of Assyria. How many know it's better to rebel against the God of this world and not God? <laughs> how many know, and this will get you, how many know, <laughs> Lord, really, my, you want me to say this. How many know it's sometimes better to rebel against your spouse than it is to rebel against God? <laughs> I'm telling you what, my wife has said some things to me and I'm just like, no. And I've done the same thing with her. I've said some things and she has said, no. <laughs> and you can get all, <sighs> we've been married for, preparing, 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 and God's put me in, and it's just like, but if it ain't God, and, and, and when I've said things to her and she has said no, I have to humble myself and say, Lord, I'm asking her to do something because it's my will and not yours. And I have to humble myself and, go, and, and then go to her too and just say, you know what, Lord? You know what, sweetheart? Um, it was for my benefit that I was asking you to do something and please forgive me. 
And thank you for standing up and holding fast to what you know is true. And I'll tell you what, if there's anybody that can hold fast, it's her. She has held fast to me many a times. <laughs> but we've got to know that we answer to one. It's him. Amen. It's him. And I know sometimes some of these things that I'll share like that seem a little bit harsh, but the bottom line is, is we answer to him. We don't, we don't answer to spouses. We don't answer to children. We don't answer to uh, whoever. Fill in the blank. We don't give account to them. The Bible says that we give account to him. And of what, what people in our life, however you fill that blank in, if they're asking you to do or asking something that is contrary to the word, and understand, contrary to the word. Sometimes there's things that are asked to the word and we rebel. <laughs> but we are to rebel against one thing. And that is the works of the enemy. In this case, says the king of Syria, Assyria, is who King Hezekiah said he rebelled against them. Meaning he didn't listen. We see that through Daniel's life and the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. There was many things that were required of them. And they were just like, you know what? With Daniel, it was like, throw me into the lion's den. I'm not bowing down. Those are pictures of holding fast. Abraham, I'll sacrifice my son, but I'm not letting go. I'll sacrifice the promise because I'm trusting God. Think about that. I'll sacrifice the promise because I'm trusting you, Father. That's showing have faith in God, not having faith in the promise. Abraham could have easily said, now that I got the promise, I'm good. But he said, no, I'm not letting hold my grip on you. I'm holding fast to you regardless, no matter what the situation. I'm holding fast to you. I'm willing to give up the promise. The promise that you said is mine. I'm willing to give that up. Holding fast. Holding steady. Keeping your grip on him. Even if you're down to one finger. And if that one finger gives away as you're falling, I trust you, Lord. And you better be saying it even more as you're falling. <laughs> Come on. Hold fast. And it all goes in with the purpose of God because you can't fulfill the purpose unless you hold fast. His purpose in your life. You've got to hold fast because there's going to be anything and everything through a lifetime that will come at you to try and get you to get hold, release your hold on him. We've all been tempted with things to release our hold on him. And it's just like to fulfill your purpose, you've got to keep your grip on him. But if you don't know what your purpose is, Back weeks ago, we started that all as you got to know what your purpose is. You got to know the purpose that He's put in you. The scriptures are real clear. The primary purpose is to be reconcilers, preach the gospel, reconcilers, and making disciples. The things that He teaches, you teach others. Don't teach what you don't know, teach what you do know. Amen. Always go, turns out better for you if you teach what you do. We say, well, I only know a couple of things. Then teach them a couple of things the best you can. <laughs> if you don't know anything about healing, don't try to tell somebody about healing. But what you do know about, and what you know about is your testimony. It's what God has done for you. Yes. Those are the things you disciple. Those are the things you tell people about. What's God done for you? Because those are the things you know as well as I do. Those are the things you're passionate about. 
I know what God's done for me. And you can share those types of things and disciple those types of things because you're passionate about it, because it's real to you. Nobody can, somebody may refute it. They may look at you if you're like me. I've had people that I've shared my testimony with as things that God has done, and they'll say, well, that's not so. Well, you can say whatever you want, but you can't talk me out of what God's done. You may not want to accept it. You may not want to believe it. You may want to say, well, that really wasn't God. You can say whatever you want. I know that I know that I know because it happened to me, and you can't tell me that my God is not faithful. I trusted in God, and he did this. Well, it wasn't God. No, it was God. Well, you just got lucky. No, it was God. Luck was not involved. People will think of every excuse they can think of to try and tell you that it's not God. But God. And you hold, see, that's where holding fast even starts. It's in what has God done for you? Because you won't let go of that. If you do, I wonder why. <laughs> why are you letting go of what you know God has already done? That he's already worked in your life. But that's the best place to hold fast. Is that, That's why in the Old Testament, they built monuments everywhere they went. To remind them, a reminder, hold fast, God will get you through here. Hold fast, God will get you through there. Hold fast, God will get you through here. Hold fast, God was faithful here. Hold fast, God was faithful here. Hold fast, God supplied there. Hold fast, God protected you there. Hold fast, God fought the battle there. Hold fast, hold fast, hold fast, hold fast. You say, well, I don't have that many. It doesn't make any difference. You can have one, and you can hold fast. But the thing is, is it won't stay at one because if you hold fast, you'll have a, a second hold fast and a third hold fast and a fourth hold fast and a fifth hold fast. It'll never stay at just one if you hold fast because God will continue to show himself faithful. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get ready to receive communion.